Take the microphone. The microphone's here. Okay. It's not even the radio mic. Hugh, where's John Green? I'm here. It's alright, JG's here. JG's here. Oh, quite right. Sound check. Is there any other drawing here? Just like the old days. <laughs> Does anyone have a microphone? John's prepared to talk to you. Oh, brilliant. Welcome to LBC. It's six o'clock, October the 8th. My name's David Jessel. This is the morning show, and here's the David news. Jessel. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody listen when we're at a door. Wow. That's <laughs> fantastic. Well done. Well done. And uh, I feel quite emotional seeing so many old faces here. When I say old, I mean, you know, old. You do old know. Faces. <laughs> <laughs> it is a brilliant thing here. Uh, it takes me back to those crazy, anarchic, creative years. And it was on the 8th of October, 50 years ago, in this very place, that independent radio was born. And a fresh new face really changed the nature of broadcasting, didn't it? If, um, we're going to be unveiling a plaque to mark that shortly. And... Um, if some memories of this place are a bit blurry, I was thinking it was because we really should be erecting plaques to the Cheshire Cheese, to the Tipperary, yeah. to the Wine Press, to the Dive Bar, yeah. and of course, the workers, where so many animated editorial discussions <laughs> uh, Gough Square is the most important site, and we're very grateful to our host, Dorrington's, who not only let us put up what you're about to see as a magnificent plaque, but they actually paid for it, which is uh, Lots of thanks to John Greenwood for organising it, going all the way to Queen's yeah, well Collective. Yeah. To Steve Gardner, who's been a wonderful chair of what we call to committee, or the Old Lags Committee. And uh, we're also going to be remembering uh, Paul Easton and Paul Risen, who very sadly aren't with us anymore, but were great members of our committee. So before we unveil the plaque, we're going to share a few memories of those early days. In fact, the very first day with, first of all, Giles Brandreth, who was presenting that day. What do you remember? Well, to say I was presenting is an exaggeration. <laughs> uh, I was paid five pounds because we were told that drive time was key. We had to achieve drive time success. And the reason we're all excited to be here is this. We are part of broadcasting history. People who were here on day one. This was an important moment but there was anxiety as to whether people would listen to the commercials. So I was engaged before every commercial to set a riddle and then give the answer of the riddle after the commercial <laughs> to entice people to listen. And I still have the card index file of all the riddles that I used and I can tell you what the first riddle was. I think it was a Monday, the 8th of October. And my first riddle was, take the letters M-O-N-D-A-Y and rearrange them into another word that expresses the essence of what LBC is going to be all about. That was my riddle. That doesn't spell chaos. No. <laughs> <laughs> it spells dynamo. <laughs> and as I was saying this, I could see out of the corner of my eye the corridor, because on day one there was no door to the main studio. As I recall, upstairs was a sort of editorial department where people sat with their head in their hands. And downstairs <laughs> was a sort of corridor with two little studios off this corridor. But there wasn't a proper door to the first studio. So there was somebody engaged, paid even less than me and even younger than me, to stand in the corridor going, shh, shh. <laughs> and then, so I, I stayed and I then did the night shift uh, where there was a wonderful character uh, after midnight called Alphonse, our only caller between midnight and 2 a.m. <laughs> we had to stick with Alphonse. His fantasies got worse and worse. He was in his bath. He volunteered to show us his rubber duck. Uh, indeed, he said he was playing with his rubber duck as he broadcast. And then the, the car climax for him that first year was Christmas Day, when I was sent by the engineers with an instrument called a ewer. Do any of you remember this ewer? Yeah. It's a very risky recording device, because unless you press two buttons simultaneously, you don't get it. 
and I was sent to Hatfield to meet Dame Barbara Cartland, our Christmas Day guest. She looks like a Christmas tree, we thought we'll have her as a Christmas Day guest. I went, I secured this brilliant interview with her, and then got back here, we played it, and there was nothing on the tape at all. But that was the essence of LBC. <laughs> And I think the reporters amongst us can identify with doing exactly that. Now, we're looking into the ewer and there being spaghetti when you went inside the machine. Now, Heather, Heather Bramble, you were also there driving the desk on that first day. Have you recovered from the trauma? Just about. <laughs> it was pretty, pretty awful. Um, nothing was finished. So there's a, a man underneath the desk still wiring things up. <laughs> so we were going on air. And yes, it was chaotic. I think all the ads have been recorded in another studio, so they weren't compatible with our machines. <laughs> Stop. And how much help from the management? Uh, they were having a party behind. <laughs> <laughs> it was very noisy, and eventually the producer, whose name I'm afraid I can't remember, mm -hmm. rather politely asked them to go. <laughs> that sounds like a very good job. Well, let me turn now to Douglas Cameron, who remembers the early days, don't you? Not very, but the very first day, but the early days. Well, I do. I remember the early days as a listener because I was working for the Today programme. What's on, that uh, again? <laughs> you know, well, I'll tell you what it is. If you're very good, I might get you an audition for that. But anyway, I was working for the Today programme and um, we were listening to it and what we heard was, uh, quite frankly, dreadful. Um, I, I, I know a station's got to start staggeringly, but this one really did stagger. And unfortunately, the publicity department, uh, eager to get things going, issued a little memo saying, you never heard anything like it. And my God, they were right, because it was awful. But when I came in spring, uh, of 1974, and I can remember standing here about five o'clock being asked to do the first breakfast show, and I remember coming through here and I'm thinking, here it is, you know, it's now or never. And it took a few months, but I think by about 1975, we began to see the light, as it were. But uh, <clears throat> whether Giles is um, little riddles did the trick or not, I don't know. But strangely enough, the ads seemed to come a little bit quicker in 1974, and things became better. I and still remember so many of them, don't you? The big red building on Petticoat Lane. Oh, They're uh, yeah, oh, yeah. oh, They go yes. on and on and on. Yes, there were some wonderful, wonderful ads. Now, with all the chaos behind the scenes, which I have to say did go on for a little while, didn't it? Oh, but yes. you always managed to make However um, badly typed, I have to say, sorry, I read guys, but however badly <laughs> typed those scripts were, your beautiful voice somehow managed to make them sound perfect. Well, that's the most kind of me to say so. <laughs> but, um, well, I don't know. Um, I, I think I had a sort of, um, I don't think it's a gift, it's an ability. But I had uh, an ability when I was reading the news to read one word, but I, my eyes went to the next two or three. So I was able to see what was coming, and sometimes it was awful, I can tell you. But uh, we managed to get through it, and um, they were under air and strain, the boys, you know, in those days. I do remember, because I, I got the odd guest shift reading the news, and I remember Steve Gardner, who's still here somewhere, um, putting, scripts, putting scripts on my desk in front of me, and then pasting his hand over the bottom part, and then read this bit and this bit, as, as in the middle of the news bulletin. It was quite yes, crazy. It was, it was quite... Uh, but uh, Bob Holness, the dear departed Bob, whom I had ten wonderful years with, uh, spotted one morning when he started singing. He said, the news will be a little late today. <laughs> and uh, we had another presenter who was uh, on the afternoon show, and um, sometimes they, they play the music up to the news, dum -dum -dum, and four o'clock came, no news, no news, the music came. So they, they said, said to uh, say something, say something. And he said, um, he said uh, I want to assure listeners, the news is coming in thick and fast. I only wish to God some of it were reaching me. <laughs> so we had, our, we had our dramatic moments, no doubt. But successes too, and I think the way that LBC and IRN told the news was a very different way, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Um, I think the BBC, and I've got to be 
a little careful here because we've got so many wonderful people here from the BBC, but I think the BBC in those days was just a little bit stodgy, a little bit stodgy, and we, I think, certainly Bob and I, and a lot of the presenters said, well, we've got to be one of the, one of the people, one of the public, you know, we've got to not read the news to them, we've got to tell them the news, and I think this is what we tried to do in a friendly way. But I think the great breakthrough was the Falklands War, where for the first time the AM programme got more listeners than the BBC Today programme. And I think it went from there. I know it was dreadful to say this about a war, but LBC were absolutely outstanding in the early 80s during the Falklands War. And I think from that time, people did start taking us really seriously. I think that's true, and we remember some wonderful reporting from Antonia Higgs, yes, from Kim Sabido, and so many more at that time. Yeah. Douglas, thanks so much. And um, I know I owe a lot of my career to the start of LBC, and so do a number of people here. Mark Easton, Clive Murray, come over. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, Clive can't be with us for, for too long today because he's got some excuse about reading some News yeah. 10 thing, whatever, whatever that might be. What are your memories of life at LBC? Um, I, I got here at the sort of fag end of life at uh, Gough Square, which is, which is a real shame. Um, but I had an amazing time, an absolutely amazing time. And what I remember most of all about being here is the good cop, bad cop relationship with the correspondents of John Breedwood. You got good cop, did you? I never I, had that. John would be like, well, that's great. Well, maybe, maybe a tweak here, a tweak there. Vince McGarry, this is effing shite. <laughs> And I got my, uh, what I love about IRM was that they were willing to give young reporters like me big significant stories and I went to Northern Ireland for the first time and, and Vince came to me just before I left and he said, Clive, be careful out there. They may think you're a fucking soldier <laughs> and shoot you in the head. Good luck. <laughs> Luckily you made it back. I, I, made, I made it back but you know, it was a wonderful, wonderful time here and I absolutely loved it and um, it was it began my career, whatever that is at the moment. So, thank too, you, IRN. Not going too badly. Mark, you have happy memories too. Well, what I can remember, because there was quite a lot of alcohol involved in life, uh, in life mm. if I remember, it is true. I remember my first day, I literally turned up my first day, I was, what, 20, 22 years old or something, and uh, I, think, I think it was Steve Gardner, he said, no, you need to come round to the pub round the corner. And I went round there, uh, it was 11 o'clock in the morning, and there was a man standing at the bar who I later discovered was Bill Deeds, huh. the then editor of the Daily Telegraph. And uh, it was explained that this was my first day in Fleet Street. And he said, you'll need a whiskey. Um, <laughs> a large one. <laughs> and so that was my induction to, uh, to Goff Square. Uh, and the drinking never really stopped after that. <laughs> um, uh, the, you, you may know this as well, Martha. There was this business of being able to drink round the clock because the... The opening hours here, the licensing hours, were different for uh, the, the printers in Fleet Street, for the people down at the meat market and so on. And, and, and so it was feasible, I think, with a slight gap in the middle of the afternoon, to always be somewhere where you could legally drink. And, uh, and people did drink round the clock, 24 hours a day. Um, and uh, some of them even survived, yes. <laughs> but despite all of that, there was some wonderful radio, wasn't there? I think the way that... LBC and IRN used actuality, went to events live. It really did change the way that radio was done. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think um, it's absolutely clear that, that uh, LBC IRN just changed everything in terms of the way that, that talk radio and, and news radio was done. As you say, it was all about being there at the time of uh, sending your reports. Um, the, the, the beginning, uh, people like John Snow, um, who was an early reporter there, uh, he, he actually broadcast from the Balkan Street siege on a walkie-talkie that had been taken, it was basically a, a, a taken out of one of the radio vehicles, I think, given to him. And, and he was able to broadcast live. No one else could do that. 
and the, and the BBC in those days um, had their very strict kind of schedule, so they couldn't break out. So actually, LBC, IRN were able just to say stories broken. Well, I mean, nowadays it feels so obvious, but then it was absolutely groundbreaking because suddenly people were able to go somewhere, um, if they lived in London initially anyway, um, they could go somewhere and listen and hear what was happening right now in terms of the news. Now we talk about sort of 24 hour news culture, obviously, you know, the, 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 the digital and all the rest of it. We can get our news whenever we want it. Back when, back when this place first opened its doors, the only place you could get 24 hour news was here. Well said, very well said. Well, I think we're going to leave the speeches and we're now going to move on to the ceremony of unveiling the plaque. So let's hope the equipment works better than, <laughs> than those viewers. Don't pull it's too hard. <laughs> you always used to say that, John. <laughs> Okay, so are we ready? Can we do a 10 Yes! Either side. Okay, everyone, are we ready? Five. Let's everyone sharing. Four. Let's have a little tiny in front of the back. Are we ready? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, let's see if we can get the camera to work. On this site stood Communications House, birthplace of the UK's first independent commercial radio station, LBC, London Broadcasting Company, and its national and international news service, IRN, Independent Radio News, launched October the 8th, 1973. Let's Yay! celebrate!